Good afternoon. Welcome to our January 14th City Council Policy Session. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, we will call the meeting to order and begin with council information and follow-up requests. Do any council members? Councilwoman yes. Stark. Thank you. Um, I just want to announce that our next District 3 Community Coffee Chat will be Monday, January 27th at 6 p.m. at the North Mountain Visitor Center. Staff from our Parks and Recreation and the Fire Department will join to talk about how to use our parks safely and efficiently. I also want to thank our Public Works Department for hosting public meetings on our solid waste proposed rate increase. I will tell you, um, I did go to the meeting last night in Sunny Slope and we had a pretty decent turnout. I also had a meeting at uh, Shadow Mountain, and that was also a good turnout. And there's another public meeting coming up that will be held Thursday, January 16th at the Paradise Valley Community Center at 6.30. And lastly, last night, the Sunny Slope Village Alliance held an event to celebrate the renovation of their building and relaunch their group. And the mayor joined me, and we recognize several community leaders up to 20, I think we gave out a thank you, and so it was a great event. Real proud of the residents of Sunny Slope stepping up to revitalize the slope. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, thank you, Mayor. So I just wanted to give a report. This morning at, at 7 a.m., we had a great co press conference to be, be able to announce to everyone a report on our LED lighting. And we announced this morning that we've put out a little bit over 100,000 lights. Um, and we did the press conference together with the mayor. So thank you, mayor. And we did it out in Maryville over at 53rd Avenue in Campbell. And I think it's a, it's a great start. Uh, I think people are very excited about the LED lights. And it, was a, and it was a great event. And it was covered tremendously. I think we had good coverage over it. So it was, it was amazing. Also, I also wanted to talk a little bit about something that's very exciting to me, is this week's opportunities for our district and the expansion of light rail in West Phoenix. Today, tomorrow, <clears throat> and Saturday, there will be public meetings to discuss the light rail extension to the Capitol and along the I-10. Today, the public meeting will start at 6 p.m. at Desert West Community Center. Tomorrow, the meeting will start at 6 p.m at Isaac Middle School. Saturday, the public meeting will include a presentation in Spanish, will take place at 9 a.m. at Neighborhood Ministries at 19th Avenue and Van Buren. I am also excited to participate in tomorrow's Coco with a Cop with 19 North. The event will start at 6 p.m. at 1829 West Northern Avenue next to the Albertsons. I'm glad to hear that our very own streets director, Kini Kini Nutson and staff from Neighborhood Services will be out with us to help answer questions and concerns about our neighbors. Also, I am happy to announce that my office will now be holding weekly office hours on Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Maryville Revitalization Corporation Business Center across the Maryville Par Ballpark. Please stop by for any questions or concerns you may have. For specifics on these events, please visit our website at phoenix.gov slash district five. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Garcia. So <clears throat> this year for, for the first time, each one of our offices got $25,000 for participatory budgeting. Um, and I wanted to announce uh, kind of what our office is thinking about doing. Um, we're hosting a series of events throughout the district. The first one being a uh, budget and bagels event that's gonna be held at the Alwyn House on Saturday, January 25th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, this is at 1204 East Roosevelt Street. Um, what we're looking to do with these events is to engage the community uh, in with a new tool that uh, our budgeting department has come up with, which is the Fund Phoenix budgeting tool. And I'd like to invite the public uh, to check it out use it, all the information that comes out of this tool is gonna to come on the back end to us. And for District 8 residents specifically, we're gonna go out, try to engage as many folks as possible um, and, and get this tool done. So hope to see people there. Thank you, uh, Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna thank all of our solid waste team that's been out there and are 
and doing these community meetings, letting people know about the, um, the fee increase. Uh, thank you for taking the time and all those individuals that participated in it. There's a couple more, I think, that are still set up. And if you can go online or go to these, um, these community meetings, it's really important to hear your feedback. Also, on Sunday, January 5th, we had um, two movies in the park. We called them Silver Dollar Events at South Plaza. Turned out to be really great. I want to thank all the businesses in South Plaza to make this happen and, and join in with our, my office to make it all. And also on January 10th, my office hosted another movie in the park. Um, it was at um, Cuban School. I want to thank the PTA organization. What an awesome event for putting it on. Also, it's that time of year again uh, for the um, Dr. Martin Luther King March and Festival. That's happening on Monday, January 20th at 9 a.m. It starts right there at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. That's right there on 14th Street in Jefferson. So it's a great event. I've been doing this ever since it started with uh, my children and before I had kids too. My parents used to take me out there. So I encourage everyone to go out there and not just take a day off, but take a day on and giving back and learning about all the great things that Martin Luther King has done and has impacted this, this great world of ours. Also, mark your calendars for the Levine Parade. Um, they have a parade every year, and it's a kickoff to the barbecue. So the parade is Saturday, February 1st. It's at 11 o'clock. It starts at 43rd Avenue in Dobbins. It's a great event. So if you live out in the Levine area, it's going to be on, mark your calendars, Saturday, February 1st at 11 o'clock. And then the following weekend is the um, Levine Barbecue. It's a Saturday, February 8th at Cesar Chavez Park. It starts at 11 till about 4.30. It's a great event. If you like some good barbecue, come on down. It's been going on for close to 70 years now. Um, you can actually see the uh, mayor and myself milking a cow out there. So I'm proud to say that I am still um, the champion. I've won it twice in a row. And um, <laughs> we'll see how the mayor does this year. And you know, today we had a great celebration, of, a groundbreaking of a new um, 25 story um, apartment complex or a multifamily complex. Um, it's Adelon, is was one of our first um, 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 ladies that actually own a mansion here in Phoenix, just south of the river, right on Central Avenue. And it was a gathering place where individuals would come and basically meet and, and talk about politics and about how to better our community. So um, Heinz, um, the developer, looked it up and found this this historic event that happened here in Phoenix, or this historic person. It was a lady that had the first rose um, garden in the city of Phoenix, the first um, vegetable garden, and basically people would come from all over on their ways to California for the great um, gold rush, and they would stop here. So it was a landing mark, and it was, a, it was really Phoenix's first house. So, you know, they're gonna name it after her, and they're going to have a, a public park. They're going to have a, a park, an urban park within their facility, and they're going to have a dog park on the top roof. So it's just incredible all these amenities that we asked for as the city of Phoenix, and they basically came through. So I just really want to thank our economic developer, development office, and especially Chris Mackey for all her help in making all this possible. And it's really bringing multifamily housing to a whole different level in downtown Phoenix. And I, hopefully it's not their last program that we'll have a lot more. And the other thing too is I wanna thank everyone for helping out in the um, 202 or as we call it, the Ed Pastor uh, Freeway. Uh, what a great change in the Levine and the Estrella Mountain area and just basically connecting our communities together from the East Valley to the West Valley. And it's just amazing what's going on in the Estrella Mountain and the Levine area that I represent, um, the, um, the stores, restaurants, and all kinds of future things. And I think we're gonna be talking about that in, the near few, in, in a couple minutes with Chris Mackey. So thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, we'll do Councilman Williams and then Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. Don't let him kid you. He's been practicing milking cows. <laughs> He's a ringer. <laughs> uh, we have two community meetings for the proposed solid waste rated changes. First one's at the Buff Community Center, 6.30 p.m. on January 23rd. The second one will be on January 28th 
at 6.30, and it will be at the Helen Drake Senior Center. And the District 1 breakfast meeting is 7.30, Friday 31st, and we will have Albert Santana there to talk about Census 2020 and how important it is that we get everyone registered. And also, we will have Jeff Barton, who's going to tell you how to use the online budget tool. So I hope people attend. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple quick things. One, I see ADOT in the audience here. I want to thank them specifically for all their help that they gave on the 51 on the water line uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, if it wasn't for you, we'd, you know, we'd be in a difficult situation. We just appreciate all the work you did on that. Uh, to the work that, like Councilman Nowakowski had mentioned, all the work that you've done in particular. <coughs> when it comes to the 202, I was never a fan of it. And I, Still not a big fan of the freeway over there cutting through the mountain, but the fact of the way you did that, the way you notified the difficult the $1.9 billion um, that you had to invest, or we, you invested in our community on that was, I mean, you did handle it quite well. I've got to tell you, it was very difficult from even the sound walls to everything else that comes with it. It's never going to be a situation where people are totally happy with it. But you came as close as I've ever seen any uh, governmental entity come to, to trying to resolve those issues, and I appreciate all that. Uh, the big one that I really want to talk about, though, is the groundbreaking this Friday for Hospice of the Valley. They've got a huge groundbreaking on 44th and Campbell, and it's where they're going to be coming in with their memory care. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with hospice, or for those of you that are, there's not much need to really tell you about. Uh, these are truly angels that are in our community. They do this because of their love. They're, I think God brought them to our lives because of how much they care. Um, it is a beautiful thing to have them. I, I just can't imagine any community in this country or anywhere without individuals like this that help people in their final days. They are truly a godsend, and they've been brought to us, and we're very lucky to have them. The groundbreaking itself was put together because there are a lot of individuals in our community, Susan Levine in particular, and the things that she's done in our community, but she was helping, you know, she got a lot of this, the funding put together. Um, it's just not an easy task. And, you know, the that's one part of it is on the capital side, but on the human side of it, I cannot imagine what it would be like in our community if we didn't have these angels. And I'm looking forward to being there. I think the mayor, I think you're planning on being there. I'm not sure. Um, but for those of you that ever need them, I would strongly recommend you talk to them and find out what it is that they provide. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, January 17th, we'll be kicking off the MLK breakfast at 7 a.m. I'm hoping to see everyone there. And then on Saturday, January 18th, I'll be hosting an event uh, for the clients of Hope's Crossing. Hope's Crossing is run by Laura Bullock. It's a nonprofit organization that help women coming out of prison transition into society. Uh, they provide counseling services, job training, resume writing, assistance with housing, clothing, and uh, the most necessities. <clears throat> I have some great community leaders that are joining me Saturday to mingle and mentor with the women. I also like to thank everyone who has donated clothing, purses, water bottles, uh, hygiene products, toothbrushes, shampoos, and soaps. And if anybody would like to donate, you're more than welcome to call my office. And then on Wednesday, January 22nd, I will be having my first coffee chat of the year at Encanto Tavern on 15th Avenue at, in Thomas at 8.30, and I hope you can join me. I do want to take a moment to address a video of two of my colleagues that have made fun of a very serious issue that we are still trying to address. While the video was meant in jest, I think it's important to address it because it was hurtful and disrespectful. It was disrespectful to the families who have lost loved ones in police shootings, it was also disrespectful of police members who put their life on the line to keep our community safe. It, and, and additionally, it was disrespectful to the business that was in the, this video that was part of this joke. But most importantly, it was disrespectful to our city employees who represent all of us. 
As elected officials, we must remember that our words and actions matter, especially when we are using city resources. Phoenix TV is a tool paid for by the city to communicate with constituents. And I'm grateful for this tool and all of us use it. I use it to promote business in my district, bring awareness to important issues, and generally to help people. To use this tool for frivolity is just wrong. Most importantly, we must remember that as an elected official, we are supposed to bring people together to address real problems and not to create more division. Thank you. Uh, I believe they said sorry to Councilman Garcia. It's bigger than just Councilman Garcia. Thank you. We will next move to agenda item one. Uh, today's council meeting is very focused on our partnership with the state of Arizona and the Arizona Department of Transportation. We have been working on many, many items together. And we actually just today got some good news that we have an intergovernmental agreement related to a water pipeline. So we have a draft uh, agreement, breaking news today, um, which would help us move a water pipeline into right of way along freeway and reduce impacts on, a, on neighborhoods and a preserve. Uh, a huge uh, thank you to our partners at MAG for their work on that and to, uh, to Steve Beauchon who is here with us today. Thank you for your leadership in that area. We are very optimistic as that moves forward. So just one example of a collaboration. Uh, today we will talk about a wide variety of issues including drainage issues, we will uh, celebrate the Ed Pastor Freeway and the many community members who worked so hard to see this day, as well as talk about how to maximize the benefits and some of the city's benefits, uh, some of the city's um, goals and, and vision in that area, and as well talk about um, a very large construction pro project and the Broadway curve that I think will require all of us to be involved and it's important that people understand as it's perhaps the most complicated construction project we have undertaken, although we certainly have many, many complicated ones in America's fastest growing city. So thank you all for being with us here today. Uh, we'll begin with the drainage improvement projects. Uh, Councilman Williams, Councilman Stark, and others have been working very, very hard on this issue. So I'm gonna turn it to Councilman Stark to introduce the item. Thank you, and thank you, Mayor, for your work on the water line. I really appreciate it. We have it, the petition coming to us tomorrow. So thank you for the good news. Um, <clears throat> and this is good news, too. And I don't know who's happier, Councilwoman Williams or myself. It could be a, a tie. But living uh, along the I-17, I often take Greenway Parkway to get onto I-17. And when it rains, you can't use it and it really backs up traffic. It really is problematic for North Phoenix. Um, so the mayor knows how I feel about this, and so she was gracious enough to let me introduce this item today, and I really want to thank ADOT for everything you've done on this. I'm gonna turn it over to Mario, and he can uh, introduce everyone. You're making me smile already, and you haven't said anything. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor uh, and Councilwoman Stark and members of the council. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about an aspect of our transportation system that we don't normally get to talk about at council policy meetings, and that's our freeways. Uh, and so uh, as with all the modes of our transportation system, whether it be a well-maintained street system, a robust light rail and bus transit program, or options for pedestrians and bicyclists, freeway system is very important to the quality of life for our residents, as well as our local economy. And today, along with our partners from the Arizona Department of Transportation, and you'll see in a few minutes from Maricopa Association of Governments, we're presenting updates on three very important projects, freeway projects, all of which are at different stages, all, all of which are located in, uh, in Phoenix uh, and are very high priorities for our community. So we're here today to talk about the benefits of those projects and the positive impacts that we expect to see 
Um, given that we've got much to talk about, uh, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Tom Remus, our freeway coordination manager, who will talk a little bit more about, what, about these projects and about who's uh, presenting with us today. Mayor and Council, thank you very much for having us here today. Presenting with me today on behalf of the Arizona Department of Transportation is Steve O'Brien, the Senior Division Administrator for the Project Management Group, and Tefwachi Katapa, the ADOT Project Manager. Now, if you've lived or have ever traveled in the northern part of the city, I'm pretty sure that you've experienced the flooding that comes along I-17 underpasses when it rains. It seems that this happens on a more and more regular basis uh, as we get the monsoons. Well, finally, we're getting some relief. Mr. O'Brien and Ms. Katapa will provide an overview of the project that includes the phasing of the construction, as well as the community outreach that has taken place and will continue to take place. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. O'Brien. Mayor, Council, uh, Council Peston, it is a real privilege to talk about this project. Um, it's a little bit out of the norm for us. Normally when we talk about freeway projects and corridors, we talk about adding lanes, we talk about intersection improvements, trying to move more traffic through things. But this has been a problem for ADOT in this area for a very long time. And even though it's not the biggest project we have, we do feel it's one of the most important that we've been able to get now into construction and get implemented to address a serious issue uh, that we have on the I-17 corridor, one of our oldest freeway corridors in, in the metro area, and address some things so that people feel like they'll be able to use these, this freeway um, during storm events. So the project, as an overview, just so you know, goes from Greenway Road and it goes down to the Arizona Canal, where it um, will end and outfall into that point. So what we're doing is we're installing a gravity drain system uh, along this corridor that it will replace four existing pump stations that we have that were installed many years ago and uh, have a hard time keeping up with the intensity of the storms that we have. Uh, it's about um, four miles of very large diameter pipe and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a minute, but it will remove those four pump stations. So for those of you who want to know more what a gravity drain system is, so effectively what we're doing is we're putting a large pipe underground. We're connecting from the surface some inlets so that the water can drain into that large pipe. That large pipe can then outfall in a location to take the water safely away. So what are some of the main features? So we're installing a little under 24,000 linear feet a very large diameter pipe, it goes up to 90 inches. Um, we'll be constructing two detention basins at the Thunderbird interchange to tie into this system. We will outfall at the ACDC uh, canal and we'll remove those, uh, those pump stations. So about the storm drain. Um, this storm drain is going to go under the frontage roads on I-17. So from Greenway down to Thunderbird, it'll be under the northbound frontage road. We'll cross the freeway, and then from that point on, it'll it, down to Peoria or down to the ACDC, it'll be on the southbound frontage road. Um, again, I said this is gonna be very large pipe, up to 90 inches in diameter, and some of this pipe will be as deep as 30 feet below existing grade at this point. It'll be a trench construction, um, that's what that photograph shows you, a little bit of how the contractor will install this pipe. Again, um, it's going to require some close coordination with the adjacent property owners and, and the neighborhoods because that frontage road in certain areas, you know, is not all that wide. This is going to take up quite a bit of that space to install this. So we'll talk about some of the closures that will be needed. Um, retention basins, again, there's two that we'll be constructing at Thunderbird Road. We will have to cross the freeway at Thunderbird. Uh, we're not going to open trench that, though. We'll do a jack and bore kind of method, so we'll install a 30-inch pipe that goes across underneath the freeway to tie the whole system together. Just to let you know that we do a lot of different coordination, not only with the City of Phoenix and the stakeholders on it, but 
In this particular case, because of where we were outfalling um, this drainage system into the ACDC, we had to coordinate with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Flood Control District. And we had to get special permits to allow us to, to take our pipe and tie it into their system. So, so far, design and construction is estimated at 38, a little over $38 million. And we did have to establish some money for temporary construction easements that allow us to, to build the facility and then get back on the property and restore the property into the nation. And that was about 124,000. So we've been through the design process. We have advertised the project and the project has actually been awarded. Uh, the firm that won the project is Fisher Contracting. That happened, the project was awarded on the, uh, the end of September. We had a pre-construction partnering meeting um, at the beginning of November, City of Phoenix staff was part of that partnering session along with a contractor and ADOT staff uh, and other entities that would be involved in the project. Right now, the contractor's construction schedule shows that they're going to start mobilization next week on this project. And right now, his construction schedule shows it's about a 20-month construction uh, to finish the project. So to make sure that we minimize impacts, I'm sorry. Quick, someone let him. When, when you, are you going to have to close the freeway? To We're not going to have to close the freeway, but I, we will talk about we are going to have to close the front frontage roads and some of the cross streets at certain times uh, to oh, do the work. Cross streets, okay. So the reason we, we, we've set up a four-phase system to build this project. And effectively, we're going to start at the south end and move to the north. So these are the four phases, the sections, and then the approximate durations uh, that that work will take place under. The reason for this is we will have closures that are necessary, but we don't want to close down the frontage road system from, for the entire length of the project. So we're going to do it in, in mile segments. So the contractor will come in and finish the pipe installation in phase one between the ACDC and the tie-in in Peoria before they'd move on to phase two. Uh, and then there would have to be a closure of that section there. So closures of the freeway, no. We will have to close portions of the frontage road at times because, the, again, the frontage road is variable width. The amount of room that's there to actually get in there and do this kind of work and install that large pipe will require some closures. Um, but we only plan on doing that one segment at a time. On the crossroads, um, when we get to the crossroads to facilitate getting the pipe across there, yes, there will be times we'll have to, we'll have to close the cross street. But the way we've set this up right now is we'd only do one cross street within the project limits at a time. There's restrictions on the time that the contractor can do that, how he has to coordinate with the city of Phoenix to make sure all this happens. And actually within the contract, uh, with the contractor, there are limited or there's liquidated damages if he doesn't adhere to those time frames uh, or the requirements set up uh, to, to make sure that these things are handled correctly. So let's talk a little bit about the outreach we've done on the project. So I've split this up into two segments. So what have we done so far through our design process? So these are the elements that we've done. There's been uh, actually some news media events associated with this project. Um, we've developed a uh, web page for the projects that'll, that'll be continued through construction. We've uh, distributed uh, flyers to the adjacent property owners and the residences there. We've actually met with some of the HOAs. Um, we participated in a community event at Metro Center where we had like a little booth or table and people could come up and ask us about the questions about the project. And that we have had some, some meetings uh, with uh, Councilwoman Stark just to give her an update on where the project is and where we were going. So what are we gonna do going forward? This is a pretty significant project for us from a community outreach because of the closures that are needed. So we have brought on a, 
a, an outside consultant, Gun Communications, to assist us in that outreach effort. Um, they'll be putting together a specific uh, outreach program uh, for the job. But in general, these are the things that we'll continue to do. We'll still do news and social media announcements. We will go ahead and, and, and distribute flyers as needed. Most likely that'll happen with each phase of construction that we do to make sure that the folks that are gonna be impacted by that closure have advance notice of what's coming down the road in a month or so so that they can prepare uh, alternative routes and things like that. Um, we're gonna maintain the web page that'll have critical information on it. One of the things people can do if they go into it, they can subscribe for email alerts. If they do that, then they will get notices routinely through their email about what's happening on the project, what's going on, will there be a closure this weekend or not, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, uh, detour signing on the city streets, if we're gonna cross, if we're gonna close Greenway, we've gotta have some ample signage and uh, detour routes established and let everybody know what's happening at, well in advance of that. So that's part of what the contractor's program will be as well as we'll be using our uh, ITS uh, infrastructure on the freeway to let people know what's going on and what's closed and, and that kind of thing. Um, we anticipate that we'll still end up doing some presentations to the planning, uh, village planning committees or HOAs if they request it. If they want information, we will go out, give them what we know. We'll actually probably request the contractor uh, they have a representative there so they can talk about what kind of construction is going on at that time if there's questions about that. And then what we call business outreach. Uh, we call them business walks, but it's basically face-to-face -face conversations with the business owners in that area during the construction uh, to let them know where we are, where we're going, if there's access issues that they need to be aware of or we need to discuss with them and the contractor needs to make provisions for it. That's where we'll do that. So those are the, the main items that'll be going on um, as we go forward. Um, I've listed the website where people can get on and find information about the project. Um, it is, we do um, ask people to subscribe. That's the best way that they get information routinely on the job. Uh, we've set up a bilingual uh, project information line and there's information that we found there. Our communications folks, as well as the contractor, are available to talk about anything that we need to do on the project. Thank you. Council member questions or comments? Wonderful, well thank you for that update. Oh, uh, Councilman Nowakowski. You know, that area also has um, ASU West and the um, Thunderbird Hospital, just to make sure that they're informed. I'm sorry? The, um, there's ASU West that's down Thunderbird, okay. on about 51st okay. Avenue. In about 59th Avenue, there's um, the Thunderbird um, Banner Hospital that there's a lot of use going through there. So it'd be good not just to let the people from that area, but even citywide that actually goes to the university and uses the hospital. And well, Mayor and Council, uh, you have city staff available to you to help you get the word out. So we're here to help put together next door messages, uh, anything that you put out to your community newsletters, anything you would like us to do to do further that outreach, we're here and available to help you with that. I would just like to say thank you very much. I have uh, talked to Tom many times over the last few years and we are greatly appreciative because that really does uh, have a heavy impact on traffic and it leads to 19th almost to 35th and up north and south of there so thank you very much for you're welcome. we're very excited about getting this project going too councilwoman stark i i just want to say thank you again and when you said it's many years i just want you to know that flooding has been there before my children were born and my son's 31. So it's been a lot of years, <laughs> a lot of years. But this is just so welcome. Thank you again. Well, thank you. Thank you for the hard work on the project. Uh, we are having more and more big storms and the better prepared we can be, uh, the better our constituents will be served. So thank you for that update. And speaking of projects that have been going on for a couple decades, uh, today we are celebrating the Congressman Ed Pastor Freeway. 
So, Mayor, I think if you'd like, we could jump to that one or we No, could. Broadway Curve, you're right. Okay. So, Mayor, Council Members, thank you very much. The next presentation that we're going to see today is on the Interstate 10 Broadway Curve Reconstruction Project. Presenting will be Eric Anderson from the Maricopa Association of Governments. He is the Executive Director. John Bolin, the MAG Transportation Economic and Finance Program Manager, and Rob Samore, who is the ADOT Senior Deputy State Engineer over major projects and alternative delivery. This project is going to be the first freeway reconstruction within the urban core. So as the mayor said, this is gonna be significant. As you know, this is a critical corridor, both for commuters and for freight. It's also extremely critical for Sky Harbor International Airport. And so MAG and ADOT have already had meetings with Sky Harbor and will continue to work with the airport as a key partner on this project. This is such an important regional project that MAG and ADOT are investing additional funds uh, for data collection on vehicles within the corridor so they could work to minimize impacts on the traveling public. Mr. Anderson and Mr. Bullen are gonna be sharing the history of this project, the status, as well as the new ways they are looking to communicate with the stakeholders, whether it be residents, adjacent businesses, and airport clients. The, community, or the communication outreach plan will be larger and more extensive than anything we have done before on an urban freeway project. ADOT has also invited the City of Phoenix to have city staff embedded with the project team throughout the completion of the project. With that, I'll turn it over to Eric Anderson. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, uh, thank you for inviting us here to talk about this very important project. Uh, you know, with the completion of the Congressman Ed Pastor Freeway uh, just last month and the opening, uh, this is the second large, this will be the second largest project we have in the region to go under construction. So South Mountain, the uh, South Mountain Ed Pastor Freeway was $1.6 billion. Uh, this project will be about $700 million. In addition, this is, this is another project that's been uh, on our, uh, in our planning uh, work for many, many years. In fact, some of the initial work was back in mid-1980s. Uh, what to do with the Broadway curve. Uh, wasn't uh, too many years ago, uh, you probably read in the paper, the plan was to do 24, 25 lanes around that curve. Uh, we basically said there has to be a better way and what came out of uh, that planning work is what you'll, you'll see today, uh, which we think will be uh, less expensive, although extremely expensive also, um, but will also provide a, a lot of uh, uh, travel time savings for uh, our commuters here. We estimate about two million hours a year will be saved in terms of travel time. Uh, this is a Prop 400 project. Proposition 400 was passed by the voters here in, in the year 2004 to extend our half cent sales tax. Uh, that tax is funding a uh, major expansion of public transportation here in the Valley as well as uh, major street projects uh, and uh, freeway projects uh, in the region. Uh, we're moving, uh, we're just starting discussions on renewing that uh, tax. Uh, hopefully for a vote in the fall of 2022, so we can continue to make these important transportation investments in the region. These transportation investments are really key to economic development in the region, uh, and quite frankly, our citizens' quality of life. Uh, the I-10 corridor is an extremely important uh, ar artery uh, through the urban area, and we have to make sure that uh, it continues flowing. So. Once again, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to provide some of the background on this project. Um, so uh, just a, a little historical perspective. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so uh, some of the early planning work, as I say, goes back to the 1980s. Uh, some of that work started again, restarted after Proposition 400 was passed. Um, and we've gone through a number of uh, studies on I-10 and I-17. Uh, over the past few years, and out of the, the culmination of all that planning work is a project that uh, Mr. Bullen here today will uh, share with you. Uh, ready to go under construction in about a year and a half uh, out. Um, you might say, well, why are we here today talking about this is, is because we think that it's gonna take that much time to get ready for this project so we can make sure we have the community outreach, the, uh, the mitigation measures in place to make sure that uh, uh, this project goes well uh, during the construction period. So, John? Uh, 
Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, again, pleased to be here today. So I'll kick off the presentation uh, first by giving an overview of the project uh, and offering some perspective about what's to come uh, in terms of what the improvements look like and then uh, ended off with really some of the strategies that we're undertaking, some of the work uh, ahead of time. We're approximately a year and a half out from construction. Um, so we're, we're really trying to get ahead of this. Um, so I'll start off uh, by giving a brief overview of the, the northern section of the project uh, and then finish it off by touching on the southern portion. Uh, so the project in its entirely stretches from approximately where the I-10, I-17 meet, what's commonly referred to as the split, uh, and extends down to just north of the I-10-202 interchange. Um, so the first element uh, between uh, approximately the split down to baseline, um, this project will be adding uh, additional lanes, uh, both general purpose lanes as well as HOV lanes. Uh, so once this project is complete, we'll have a total of six general purpose lanes uh, between the split down to baseline uh, with two HOV lanes. We'll also be installing the region's first, uh, what's called collector distributor roadway system. Uh, I'll touch on that here briefly in a moment, um, but that will run uh, between 40th Street and Baseline. We'll also be uh, making improvements to both the State Route 143 and US 60 interchange, uh, specifically widening both of those interchanges to be able to accommodate the additional lanes. Uh, and then uh, I'll touch a bit briefly on the southern portion of the project momentarily. So as I had mentioned, um, as part of this project, we will be putting in what's known as collector distributor lanes uh, between approximately 40th Street and Baseline Road. Uh, those of you that have traveled elsewhere uh, have probably seen them throughout the country. Um, they're fairly, uh, fairly normal practice elsewhere, uh, but they will be new to this region. Uh, however, they offer numerous advantages uh, and will really improve traffic flow in this corridor. So the roadway systems look uh, a whole lot like frontage roads, but in effect, uh, they function as a roadway system off the main line uh, to be able to support those on-off movements. What that helps to do uh, is reduce the number of weaving movements that you see on the main line. So if we wanted to travel between uh, Baseline Road and State Route 143, for instance, we could use the CD roadway system without ever having to get on the main line. Uh, so those that want to travel through this area of the corridor can do so, uh, and those that want to uh, venture in different directions are able to use the CD system. And then rounding off the southern portion of the project uh, between baseline to just north of the I-10-202 TI, uh, we will be adding an additional general purpose lane in each direction. Uh, it's anticipated that we'll be able to accomplish this uh, through restriping, so minimal construction efforts would be needed. One of the primary components of the project, or really the bulk of the work, will be focused uh, in the area around 143 and I-10. Uh, so the image on the screen shows the current aerial configuration of the interchange. Um, as you can see, um, if we layer on top uh, what the proposed uh, configuration is, there's a significant change. Uh, the purple highlight represents the new roadway profile. Uh, so on there, towards the outer edges, you can see the new collector distributor roads, uh, as well as improved access to State Route 143, um, Broadway Road. The orange shading uh, represents new structure that will be put in as part of this project. Uh, so in total, in the vicinity of this area, there will be five new uh, bridges constructed. Now to put that into perspective, uh, the graphic on the screen shows the current crossing of 48th Street and I-10. Uh, you can see the current lane configuration as well as the two frontage roads. Now this pro project will require the construction of new bridges. The graphic on the screen shows the new profile. Obviously the bridge span is significantly larger than the old bridge span before it. With the addition of both the new HOV lanes the new general purpose lanes, as well as the collector distributor roadway system. With that being said, this project 
Um, while it brings numerous benefits, will bring challenges in terms of constructability. Uh, this is an issue that MAG and ADOT have been working on in close partnership uh, in anticipation for the construction. So the construction of the new bridges, uh, as well as the additional work, will all have to occur uh, while the I-10 main line continues to operate. Uh, the I-10 main line carries almost 300,000 vehicles per day in this area of roadway. It's a very heavily traveled corridor of the freeway uh, and certainly is essential to the vitality of the region's economy. Uh, as a result, uh, we're here to talk through uh, a couple of the efforts that we've uh, initiated uh, in anticipation for the construction. One of the items that we've um, pushed out uh, is a comprehensive data analysis effort. So really what we want to do is get the best idea of what's going on with traffic on the corridor. Be able to understand who's traveling it, when they're traveling it, why they make some of the decisions they make, uh, and really have as good a, a feeling uh, for what's going on as possible. One of the next steps with this, uh, we are actually working with Texas A&M Transportation Institute, uh, who's one of the nation's really leading uh, or premier uh, transportation research firms to develop a dynamic traffic simulation model. So based on the real world inputs, uh, we'll be able to develop what if scenarios to understand how construction might impact traffic uh, and what tools really we have at our uh, disposal to be able to mitigate some of those impacts to make things a little smoother. We also anticipate that all the data that we help collect will really assist with stakeholder engagement efforts. Uh, as businesses want to know, what might this project, what might impacts will this project have uh, during construction? Uh, what will this project look like after construction? Uh, what are some of the different options that we have? Uh, and really also help to mitigate some of those impacts that we see to the traveling public during construction. We're also working closely uh, with all the stakeholders throughout the region. Uh, we certainly recognize that there's a lot of construction going on uh, right now and continuing through the future. So we're working with our partners to catalog uh, what all those construction activities are uh, and to really uh, determine how those might impact this project, how we can better coordinate and really look ahead uh, at what's to come. So uh, on the screen, we have listed a few. Uh, we have the Tempe streetcar uh, that's anticipated to be completed in 2021. Uh, Avenida del Yaqui in the town of Guadalupe will also be under construction during this time frame. That's anticipated to be completed in 2022. Of course, there's the South Central light rail extension uh, that will be under construction. Uh, and then we've been coordinating very closely uh, with Sky Harbor International Airport and their construction efforts. Uh, again, this is one of those continuing activities that will monitor and work closely with stakeholders. We're also working closely uh, with both Valley Metro and the City of Phoenix Public Transit Department uh, for what the impact is, the potential impact of this project on regional transit operations might be. Uh, we're actually going a step further um, because we feel like transit might be a solution to some of the issues that we see during construction. Uh, that is, does transit offer the possibility to provide increased travel reliability? Might we be able to mitigate some of the additional congestion through transit options? Uh, these are all uh, items that we're exploring closely with our partners. Uh, and again, the data collection effort will really help yield some of those answers. On the local roadway system, uh, we're also assessing what the impact of construction activities will be uh, in terms of mobility on the arterial roads. This project uh, transverses a total of four different jurisdictions, City of Phoenix, uh, City of Tempe, Town of Gu Guadalupe, and City of Chandler. Uh, from a regional perspective, uh, we need to make sure that close coordination occurs between all the partners. Uh, during construction closures, uh, ADOT will be able to divert traffic to elsewhere in the main line, whether it be the 101, the 202, um, but we all know uh, that some of the traffic will divert to local roadways. We need to be sure that we understand what the impact on those local roadways will be uh, and really try and push out efforts to get out in front of that to help traffic move a little 
faster, a little more efficiently. So that's another activity that we've also initiated, of course, working closely with our partners. And then the last element, and perhaps the most important element, is a robust community outreach effort. Uh, we're, we're approximately a year and a half out from construction, um, but it's really important that we engage with the community early and often. Uh, as part of this effort, we, while this might be uh, this region's first major reconstruction effort, uh, it has certainly happened throughout the country elsewhere. So we've been studying those other projects, trying to take away lessons learned, best examples. In fact, a team of us traveled up to Las Vegas a few weeks ago. Uh, Project Neon up there just wrapped up, uh, similar in type and kind. And we worked closely with Nevada DOT, as well as the city of Las Vegas, to figure out lessons learned to apply to this project. One of the constant themes that we've seen in successful reconstruction proje projects is a robust community outreach effort and the important role that that plays. So we intend on partnering very close with ADOT, MAG, City Phoenix, Tempe, Chandler, and Guadalupe, of course. Here's a list of some of the stakeholder meetings that have occurred thus far. Uh, it's important to note that this project is still working its way through the environmental process. Uh, the draft environmental assessment is available for review. A public meeting was held in October of 2019. Uh, and uh, once the environmental process concludes, uh, we anticipate that we'll develop a very comprehensive, very robust public engagement plan uh, to start sharing some of the data that we've acquired. Uh, start, start sharing some of the thoughts and really get feedback from the community uh, that we can incorporate into the project. So the estimated construction schedule of this project, uh, ADOT estimates that it'll begin sometime in the spring of 2021 and extend through the summer or fall of 2024. Uh, currently, in the technical provisions, ADOT requires that the developer must maintain all lanes and movements during the weekday travel times, peak times. Uh, weekend night closures are permitted, uh, as well as weekend closures. Uh, currently, the specifications call for up to 50 weekend closures. Uh, the team is evaluating uh, potential longer term closures that might result in a shorter construction duration. Uh, in particular, given the amount of work that needs to occur at the State Route 143 I-10 interchange, assessing either a partial or a full closure of 143 and what m impacts that might have in terms of schedule. Uh, again, uh, that's an item for which uh, the data collection effort that we're undergoing right now will help inform uh, and certainly it will require significant community engagement and that will be an essential part of the analysis moving forward. In terms of the schedule moving forward, uh, so a uh, proposal is on the street uh, to bidders. Uh, that proposal is currently scheduled to be due in June of 2020. Uh, ADOT hopes to have executed that agreement this fall, fall of 2020, uh, and start design in November of 2020. The anticipated construction timeline, again, spring, summer of 2021 through summer, fall of 2024. Mayor, uh, Mayor. Yeah, just to, to add on a, a couple of things on the outreach in particular, I think we, uh, as John mentioned, uh, this is gonna be the most disruptive project we've had in the region and from a transportation perspective. It's a long corridor. There's about 4,000 employers uh, in this corridor, uh, let alone the number of people that use this corridor to get into downtown Phoenix or elsewhere in the valley. So <clears throat> we're looking at uh, doing uh, everything from making sure that the, uh, tr the firms that provide that travel information, the interexes of the world and uh, XM traffic uh, have up-to-date uh, construction uh, information, do detour information too, and then doing proactive uh, 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 practices like uh, uh, having apps that someone can look at their app in the morning and, and look at, at the real-time traffic conditions and suggested detours and, uh, and alternative ways to get around. I think transit has a great opportunity here. Uh, I think we can uh, maybe get some people attracted to transit that haven't used it in the past. So uh, I think that's a, another major uh, advantage we have here. 
a lot of work to do. Uh, we have a lot of uh, planning work to do to make sure that uh, we have the, the best mitigation, traffic mitigation plans in place, and we'll certainly share that with, with the stakeholders up and down the corridor as well as the, the, uh, our member jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this presentation. I think it's very important for this body to receive this information. Although the project is primarily in District 8 and District 6, it really has citywide and regional implications. I appreciate the airport being here today, our partners at the Phoenix Chamber and others. It's going to have to be an all hands on deck coordination. We're going to have to work with employers in the area, utilities, city construction. We really want to consider all of that as we move forward and now is the time to begin that planning and prioritization. Uh, Councilmember Garcia represents much of the area. Turn it to Council I think Member. most of it except the right side of 48th Street, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanna you know, thank you for the presentation. I got to ride with Robert as he uh, showed us the, the Loop 202. One of the really impressive things that happened there was uh, kind of private and public folks coming together under one umbrella. Um, we've even you know, talked about uh, looking at that sample in some of the light rail construction and other things. So I just want to encourage that type of participation and collaboration um, like we saw on the Epistore Freeway. Um, and then I think for, for our team, it's going to be really important to use this year and, year and a half uh, to make sure 48th Street, but then Baseline Southern and Broadway itself we're obviously addressing a problem that already exists and we're already having issues, particularly down Broadway and all the smaller streets. And so I really wanna uh, figure out if we could do our own kind of task force citywide uh, to make sure that we can do some improvements to Broadway and Southern and the connector streets there to make sure that we're ready and being able to communicate once the, the project starts in a year and a half. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, I can speak for myself and maybe that anyone else up here on the council. We're excited to have this thing going. Uh, it's been long awaited. Uh, it's time to get it going under construction. I can't imagine you're getting much pushback on this thing at all. I think if anything, the kind of pushback you're going to be getting is like, get in the ground, get it done. Um, one of the things I want to mention too, and was the full closures. And I didn't like it at first but I'm sold that it does work. I don't know if it works in every instance, but it does after two or three years of construction. You just want it done at that point. And sometimes those full closures help you get it done a lot faster. Well, not sometimes, they actually do help you get it done a lot faster. And there will be a, that fatigue factor later on. And you know, if I witnessed what, you know, if, if, if we're gonna witness what we were able to see what you did on the 1.9 billion dollar construction was pretty spectacular. Tom knows, I mean, Tom's you know, spoken your praises and I have too. I mean, you're always gonna have issues. Those things are going to come up. But the way you handled a project of that mass was pretty spectacular on its own. I mean, are you gonna get everybody happy? No, that's just not gonna happen that way. And is it gonna impact some people? Yes, it's going to do that. It's gonna impact a lot of us. Uh, for those, you know, I'm one that takes that curve. And so I'm just beyond excited. Let me know what I need to do to be a partner with you to help you out on that. I'm really looking forward to this. If there is a way to shrink that timeline, I think that would be huge. Uh, for the rest of the council that haven't witnessed the, uh, the, the fact that they impose fines on the developer for not meeting deadlines is incredibly creative and it works. Um, they actually had the developer in for discussions. I think you're supposed to open up on the 20th. I think you opened up on the 20th. Uh, Tom in our, at the city is, does spectacular work. Tom, I know that you're not part of this presentation, but every time a constituent called you, you were always on game, always on game. Remember the paint that was off a little bit? I mean, Tom actually went from wherever he was at, drove out there, and looked at it and goes, yeah, I think we're gonna have to change the paint on this thing. I mean, that's how dedicated he is. I know sometimes there's always this conflict that goes on because there's this push, you know, give and, give and pull. But at the end of the day, his intentions, and he's always done a, an amazing job here at the city, and we do respect the work that he does, as, long, as well as the work that you, all of you are doing out there. Um, like again, this is going to be a huge economic boost. Um, 
for those of us that want to see our economy grow and expand out, this is going to be a key driver for our economy, and it will get full. I mean, as fast as you build it, people will be able to fill that up, and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. That means those people are going to jobs. For those of you that may not remember, back in 2007, 8, 9, and 10, we ended up having nobody on the freeway. There was nobody on there. It was always empty. And that just meant that there weren't any jobs around. Now we have a lot of jobs. Um, so and I'm glad we're not going to be cutting through any mountains <laughs> or anything else like that because those, you know, to a large degree, well, they are. They're very sacred to many of us here. I mean, we just we respect the fact that we live in a desert. And we do have that. And, but you've done, I'll tell you from my end of it, you've really done a good job. And I appreciate that work. Thank you. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Just some um, clarification. Um, you said that you're going to add an extra lane on baseline, was it, or was it Broadway? Um, mayors, members of the council, so we'll be adding additional general purpose lanes on the freeway. All right. Uh, so uh, we'll bring it up to a total of six general purpose lanes between uh, the split and baseline road, and then two HOV lanes between the split and baseline road. And then south of Baseline Road, we'll have an additional general purpose lane installed as part of the project. All right, thank you. And the other thing is, um, I want to also join in praising Tom Remus for everything he's done with the 202 and with the um, I mean, the Broadway. I mean, it was just great communication between the community, the city, and the developer on the um, I mean, the Broadway, and also with the um, 202 Connect. It was just incredible how we got the messages we would get complaints call tom and he would find the um the solution for us so once again that's a that's a great weapon that the city of phoenix has and the resource and use it if you if you can can you speak a little bit to the uh, challenges between longer dura duration and shorter duration but higher impact uh, particularly with the 143, how long it might for how long it might be closed, and what would be the stakeholder process that you go in? Do we do a, a full closure or partial? Yeah, Mayor, this is uh, Robert Samore. I'm the senior deputy state engineer. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to come here. I think the trade-off here is if we close the 143 or any ramp, we can get in and get out, do it a little quicker. One of the challenges that's not very clear in the two-dimensional picture that you see is we're essentially building an interchange similar to either the South Mountain or the US 60 to the east at the location of the 143. So we're getting rid of the loop ramp from South 143 to East 10 and building a flyover. We're going in and building a direct HOV from the median of I-10 to the median of 143. And with all of that construction, we're eliminating two of the existing 48th Street bridges and replacing them to lengthen them and removing the Broadway Road Bridge and lengthening it. So when you think about the number of times you have to either set up a closure or mobilize in a crane or swing girders or pour concrete, the question becomes how many times are you going to impact motorists before they're going to find a new route? So for example, the 143, what you see there is going to change significantly in elevation and width just by virtue of the number of lanes coming in there. So while we can keep the 143 open, if I was either a motorist going to a business or to the airport, today the right lane may be closed, tomorrow the left lane may be closed. At some point, you may not want to risk being late to either a meeting or the airport so you're going to find a different route. And so some of these transportation management strategies we're looking at through the origin destination is to find out not only where people go today, but to model where the ants scatter, so to speak, during a closure. Typically what ADOT does is we model the end result of the project. What will the level of service be in the 20-year horizon? But what we're doing today with this project is we're looking at what will those impacts be? And we'll be a little smarter about that in the coming months, but it comes down to do you close it, get in and get out, or do you do routine weekend and night closures, 
Monday morning, it's open, you shift the traffic left, you shift the traffic right, and so you basically are working around that traffic. There's potential safety impacts for the workers, the motorists, and then just that extra communication. Once it's closed, it's closed. The messages take an alternative route, and we educate the community that way. But if you try to work while it's open, you have to constantly be explaining you know, the left lanes open, the right lanes open and such. So I think what you do is you extend that duration and potentially confuse the, the general public on what is actually going on there. And if we did do a full closure of the 143, will you tell us about the duration of that closure? Right now, I think we were estimating approximately a year, but one of the challenges is this is a kind of a new concept. We've never closed a freeway in its entirety to rebuild it. I think regionally we're going to have to look at that and other major reconstructions. So I don't think this is going to be the, the last ask uh, in the regional system. It's just the, look at the Durango curve. Rebuilding that is going to be a challenge and other areas in the valley. So right now we're thinking it's about a year. But part of that is getting the feel of the council talking to the airport and starting to engage those communities to see what is tolerable. The other alternative is a partial closure where you allow ingress and egress on the 143, but not the through movement over I-10. That also could help. It, it, it's an iterative process to see what's palatable, and then we start looking at the durations. But right now, sitting here today, I would say a year. Okay. I just think it's important for this council to know it would be new for us to close a freeway for, sure. for many months, and people may want to weigh in on that. We should also talk about how we would talk with the stakeholders in the area, because I'm imagining they have some strong opinions as well. And I don't know if Eric wanted to add. I, I, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Members of the Council, just to, to add on with what Rob said, I think there's a, a lot of analysis that we need to do in terms of uh, which way do you go on this, do you full, full closure, partial closure, and what the uh, cons overall construction time is and what the uh, time for those closures might be. So there's a lot of work we need to do to, to analyze that, and, and as Rob said, we'll be bringing that back to the stakeholders, uh, certainly the City of Phoenix uh, and Tempe, Chandler, and Guadalupe, to, to uh, talk about that too. The thing I want to mention, and uh, in conversations with Mayor Gallego, she suggested also we want to make sure that the development team has incentives to minimize um, travel problems, I guess would be the generic way to put it, uh, as opposed to just being incentivized to uh, save money and time. And so once again, there's another uh, component of that that's impact on the traveling public, and, and we'll work with ADOT and see how we might be able to put that, uh, how to uh, operationalize that concept. Thank you. I do think it's important. With the 202 project, we saw very strong incentives about project timeline and the budget. And, and with this key corridor, you know, central business district, airport, universities, we do want to make sure that there's great incentives and that the, the ADOT business partners are rewarded for managing traffic control and working with stakeholders as much as possible. Vice Mayor. Yes, um, one of my questions, because I live in, in the west side, so when we were doing um, the construction on the 202, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so one of the questions that I have, having like a partial closure of the freeway, is that going to make it easier or is it going to make it harder? Because at least on, on the 10, when there were partial closures or when it was closed on the weekend, I'm not sure that that helped the traffic. I think the traffic was even even worse with the partial closure because people thought that they could probably get on the freeway and still get to where they needed to get, or is it just better to close it? I would like to see um, what's the impact on the traffic because the one thing that people want to know it's am I how much longer is it going to take me to get somewhere, and if we could get done sooner um, and close it, or or does it or does it help? keeping it partially open. And, and like you said, like the confusion is also a, a frustrating component that at least someone that lives on the west side, it, like it was frustrating not to know when the 10 was open and, and when it wasn't. Mayor, members council, I think that's exactly right. I think that's what uh, Rob was alluding to, that if you have partial closures, closures people aren't sure exactly what's gonna happen. 
Uh, and sometimes you have to do a full closure, uh, certainly when the structures are taken down that are, exist over I-10 now, I-10 is going to have to be closed at least for a weekend or two to, as those structures come down. Uh, and then closed again as those structures are put back up. So uh, those are the weekend closures I think we talked about during the during the presentation. The 143 closure is the big one, whether that's going to be a complete closure for an extended period of time. And the trade-off there is if it can be closed and that work can be done uh, uh, more quickly, um, that's going to be a benefit overall to the project. And it also gives people certainty it's closed. It's going to be closed for three months, six months, whatever that duration is, so people know it's closed, and so they can, um, they can take uh, alternative routes. And we also want to start this planning as early as possible so that we can communicate with as many partners as possible. Occasionally during 202 construction, we would get inquiries that would be things like, who is the idiot who allowed a gas pipeline project to be on the detour road while the freeway is closed? And I'm concerned that, that the, the idiot they were pointing to was here. Um, specifically, I think they wanted me to, what are you going to do to make sure people are coordinating? And so I want this to be something that is on the top of mind for our water department, our streets department, our utility partners. The more we can plan in advance and make sure that we don't have closures on the roads that are detours, the better, and as well understand we're going to have heavy traffic on some of those roads in the area. But with that type of advanced planning, we really do need to start now so that we can minimize disruptions as much as possible. An added complication here is that uh, we, we did weekend closures with the 202. Some of the busiest travel times at Sky Harbor would be during those weekend closures. And so I hope we can work with our airport and our tourism industry so that we're communicating as well as possible and that sharing as much data as possible about when are the busy times. I think you've spoken a little bit that we would try to schedule around larger events as much as possible, but with this long of a duration, it can't be everything. Certainly, Mayor, Managers of the Council. Um, so really good point. So currently within the, the technical provisions, we do work around those uh, special event busy times, um, and that's uh, consideration going forward. I think with the data collection and the information analysis that will provide um, all these or at least some of the answers to some of these questions that we have as we engage with the public about what this might look like and what some of the alternatives might be. So I think uh, once, once that data uh, and analysis effort takes place, I think it's uh, reaching out to the community and really doing a lot of listening, uh, providing them that context, providing them that information. Um, and if I could, um, to, to your point about uh, coordination with, with local projects and other projects in the vicinity, that was one of the key takeaways from our visit with Project Neon up in Las Vegas, uh, that coordination, those feedback loops that need to pay, take place, and really the importance. So that's certainly an item that we've identified, and uh, we'll work with the project team to figure out how we implement that. And I think it'd be worth bringing people from other regions to talk about their success stories. We really do need to explain why this is important, why we're doing it, what would the benefits would be. And so probably more so than ever before, we need a robust media and education strategy to under so that the public understands what is the benefit on the other side of, of construction. Uh, Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. You know, when you talk about closures, it's easier to talk about politics at Thanksgiving dinner than it is about closures. Uh, but having lived through this and, you know, didn't want to do it, it is actually not as bad as it sounds. Um, it is painful. It's not always easy, for sure. There is no doubt about it. But Rob and his team did an amazing job. I mean, I saw it firsthand in what they did in my district. I did not like the idea at first, but they convinced me. We went along with it, and they were right. I was wrong. Um, but they really did a spectacular job of trying to make it work. Were people inconvenienced? Yes. Was it difficult? Yes. But the way it was handled was quite spectacular, is all I've got to say. So again, I was not a fan of this freeway that they built around. I just wasn't. Um, and you know, it is what it is. But at the end of the day, the way they handled it was, um, and did we have issues? Yes. But the way they handled it, and I don't want to give any qualifiers, because it really doesn't require a qualifier at this point. Uh, Rob and his team just did a really good job. And I expect that they would do that same job uh, moving forward. So it's just one of those difficult things whenever you bring it up. 
but it is something that once it's done, you sit there and you go, wow, we were able to work, not we, they worked it through and made it work. So it's just something to think about. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Garcia. This is gonna be a little selfish comment. Um, and how much room is there, and, and I know these conversations aren't happening just with you all, of, uh, of resource sharing? And then also, I think for, for, for District 8, one of the, the asks I often get is on, on 16th Street, uh, on off-ramp heading west and an on-ramp heading east. Um, and is there room for projects of that sort because I could see that as being, I'm gonna to look to Jim to, to confirm, as a place to alleviate, like is there a smaller project that we could get done first to alleviate the 143 being closed and allowing people to get to the airport different ways? Um, kind of feeding two birds with one bread, knowing that there's that need there and then the possibility of it also serving a purpose while the freeway is closed. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, uh, we can certainly look at that. I can't say right off, the, right off the bat whether that's possible or not. It's kind of late to have a new project entered in, but we certainly can, can meet with you and get more details on that and see if there's anything we can do to, to possibly provide uh, some additional resources. And Mayor, members of the council, too, one of the, one of the activities that we uh, intend on undertaking, as I had mentioned, is that dynamic traffic modeling. Uh, and it's through that exercise that we'll really be able to identify what some potential bottlenecks might be uh, and then work closely with Phoenix staff too to identify what potential solutions are out there. So. Thank you. Um, we also have people speaking multiple different languages in this corridor and so as we build the communications team, I think language skills will be important as well. Any final comments? Well, thank you for this update. An important project, but a complicated one. All right, Mayor, members of the council, our final presentation for the day is on the new Congressman Ed Pastor Freeway. Joining me today is Christine Mackey, the City of Phoenix Community and Economic Development Director, and once again, Rob Smore from ADOT, who is a Senior Deputy State Engineer over major projects and alternative deliveries. For years, Phoenix residents in the Southwest Valley have, have had to contend with congestion, lack of crossings at the Salt River when water is flowing, as well as added commute time to get around the valley um, for jobs, other entertainment opportunities. But with the new freeway, we have opened up the Southwest Valley, and Ms. Mackey is going to join in on this presentation to talk about all that she and her team are doing to bring new jobs and amenities to this part of our community. It was exciting that on December 18th, uh, the mayor and council members joined the governor, legislators, county supervisors, and other officials to finally announce the opening of this new facility. Uh, it was a great day, and later that weekend, uh, the facility actually opened up to traffic. Just as a reminder, for those who might be watching, the new 22-mile facility stretches from the I-10 Papago in the north to the I-10 Maricopa in the south. This is after 37 years of planning, three years of construction, and as I mentioned, it finally opened to traffic on December 21st. There's still some work to be done, and Rob and the ADOT team are working to put in a new interchange at 32nd Street, a new pedestrian bridge that is just north of Broadway Road to connect the communities and connect the schools. And there's this new shared use path that's gonna be located on the former Pecos Road. It's a six mile segment there for users to use. Ada and the contractor are still working on installing landscaping, quiet pavement, and they're working with residents with questions on lighting, sound walls, uh, and other issues now that the freeway is open to traffic. As I mentioned, uh, 
This has all been in preparation to get ready for all of the booming development that's going to happen in the region. Uh, Early on, the city worked with ADOT to adjust the freeway design plans to keep the streets at their current elevations so that development could occur on all four corners. And that was important for Ms. Mackey and her team. Additionally, we worked with ADOT to extend uh, the crossroads, to build them out to their ultimate configurations, so that way we would eliminate bottlenecks as new development went in there and widened the city street system. Rob and his team also worked with the city to move a drainage system at Dobbins Road. And what that did is that opened up 2.5 uh, million square feet of developable land. So that way we didn't have drainage basins all around that area, but we had area where businesses could come into. Uh, during this project, the City of Phoenix, uh, the Maricopa Association of Governments, and the Maricopa County have started a Southwest Transportation Study. And the goal of that study is to improve the traffic circulation in the South Mountain and Levine villages. Currently, there's a patchwork of land uses and roadway designations. And through this study, we hope to have some solutions for the future. One of our successes, I think, uh, is a baseline road partnership. So, Early on, the City of Phoenix uh, uh, collaborated with seven Levine property owners for about nine months to construct roadway improvements at 59th Avenue and Baseline. Uh, this was a big endeavor to get that many people and their attorneys in a room to figure out how we were gonna build out the roadway to the full capacity with sidewalks, curb, gutter, et cetera. Um, the funding that everyone partnered up was able to finish out those improvements. And the picture that you see in front of you shows one of the developments that has gone in. It's the new sprouts there at the Kitchell development that I know Ms. Mackey is gonna be talking about in her presentation. Um, the sprouts had a grand opening in September to great success, and there's more businesses that will be coming in there. With that, it's a great segue into what Ms. Mackey and her team are doing in the area. Chris. Thanks, Tom. Mayor, members of the council, we are really excited to be here today to talk with you about the Congressman Ed Pastor Freeway as we move forward. The western segment in economic development, we've branded it the South Mountain Technology Corridor and are here today to talk to you about all that we see coming. As you know, the city is broken down into 13 employment corridors and today you have one really excited economic development team sitting behind me ready to work on the 14th employment corridor, which is the South Mountain Technology Corridor. Uh, as we look, uh, you know, 22 miles of new freeway uh, wakes up just about everybody, including our companies and all that can happen in this new segment of freeway. This really is the, the most significant freeway that connects the West Valley to the East Valley uh, for our workforce and making the ease of their movement moving through. It really, is, this area is a case for a diversified economy. 60% uh, of the West Valley's workforce commutes east of I-17 to go to work each and every day. 28% of the region's manufacturing talent live west, uh, live in the West Valley. 37% of our healthcare talent lives in the West Valley. And 34% of the region's finance and insurance company uh, workforce lives in the West Valley. This connection on the 202 and bringing new companies, new technology companies along the South Mountain Technology Corridor could get some of our citizens as much as two hours of their lives back each and every day by not having to, be, uh, having to commute to their work. What can we expect as we are now open with the new Loop 202? Uh, we'll see advanced manufacturing and technology companies, aerospace and defense. We'll see corporate campuses and business parks advanced business services, and what I mean by that, uh, finance, uh, insurance companies, software, cyber uh, intelligence type companies, data centers moving into the area, and emerging technologies. This is a corridor where the city and economic development will focus strongly on bringing new leading edge knowledge economy jobs into this corridor, uh, creating a, a vibrant uh, opportunity for our citizens. Uh, as you look at the northern section of the 202 as it exists today, it is a significant number of large manufacturing, transportation and logistics, uh, and other types of, of larger companies. 
that area, while it still has some availability along the 202, I think we'll predominantly see it continue to build in a similar method by which it's built today with those type of companies, although we're working also with leading edge companies in that area. If we look south of the river, is where we, uh, we see the greatest opportunity to bring in those new companies. Let's use an example of baseline in the 202 for this area. It's only six miles from Interstate 10, 11 miles from downtown Phoenix, and there's 108,000 households uh, in a 10 minute commute of that intersection. We have significant amounts of infrastructure with SRP. We have uh, substations in the area. We have large power lines ranging from 69 kV to 500 kV lines. Strong water and sewer, telecommunications ready to expand. We've also got a great workforce in the area. Uh, at the hub of Baseline in the 202, 20, we've seen a 28% growth in population just in the last 10 years and an 8% growth in population expected just in the next five. Uh, it's a very young workforce. The median age is about 30 years old, which is a, a really young a knowledge economy workforce. 40% of the household are married uh, with children, and not the TV show. They are married with kids. Uh, and then the average household income is significant in the area at $81,000. We'll see uh, businesses that come into the area and companies that build in a very attractive manner with large landscape, large setbacks, uh, grand entries into the area, uh, attractive signage, uh, office buildings, and flexible technology type buildings. Ultimately, what we'll see is the creation of a knowledge intensive uh, business parks and corporate campuses. We've been working with the existing property owners so they really understand the city's vision of what we're looking for. And we didn't just start working with them. Um, my team started five years ago, and Alan Stevenson's team started with them well before that. And I think those founding farm families are very excited for the opportunities that are coming along. It's really interesting. Uh, the commercial development community, uh, as Mr. Ramos spoke about, Freeway's been in planning for 37 years. It's been under construction for three years, and the commercial development community woke up on Christmas morning and went, oh, there's a freeway there. And our phones have been ringing off the hook ever since. I think we'll see uh, probably before mid this year, the first of the, of the significant commercial park size and scale, the developers start to take down their properties in that area. It is critical that we keep that vision of this high tech knowledge intensive corridor so that we can provide great jobs for our citizens so they don't have to continue to commute and so we can command the types of jobs that this council's always envisioned in our West Valley. Uh, we have housing and amenities to support this. They're continuing to move along, uh, which are bringing a are really gonna support that great job growth for our citizens. At ultimate build out, we'll see 50 to 80,000 jobs uh, in that corridor for our citizens. I will share with you that I had the pleasure last night of speaking to the Levine Village Planning Commission. I think a number of them are here today, and we had some fun last night talking about the opportunities and holding to that vision of what we need to do in this corridor to ensure that those great jobs, which will take some time, have the opportunity to build out to create this great sustainable area of our city. One thing they ask us all the time, especially our citizens during budget meetings, uh, Mayor, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, you hear that quite frequently. Uh, Councilman Garcia will hear it at this budget meeting. Um, where's our retail and where's our amenities? As you know, Levine is absolutely heating up in its activity. Their retail market currently has just over 2 million square feet, 630,000 of which have built in this last year. The dominant retail intersection is and is going to continue to be baseline in the 202. That's where we're gonna see the power centers really develop with those support services. In fact, you can see the dark blue on the map. The more intense the development, the darker the blue and the color of the development of those particular shopping centers. We've identified the retail leakage. And what I mean by that is, what are our citizens in the West Valley having to leave Phoenix to get? Where can we recapture back our own sales tax dollars? And one of those things that was in great demand, we heard loud and clear from our budget hearings uh, year, from years ago, was a movie theater. 
And at the budget meeting this last year, of course, Harkins announced that they would be opening this council at your last meeting, heard a, a, an item from them, and they're moving forward with their development. If we look at Levine Park Place, which is where Harkins will be located, uh, Sprouts did open there, as uh, Mr. Remus mentioned earlier, but also TJ Maxx uh, and Michaels are under construction at that location, and there are a number of other uh, home good and uh, um, clothing stores that are, are uh, in their finer, final uh, um, lease activity with Kitchell, and we'll be able to announce those to you in the near future. But I know near and dear, especially to the mayor's heart and, and Councilman Nowakowski's heart, who gets beaten at all of their meetings, sit-down restaurants. I think my first budget meeting, I was told if I brought another pizza restaurant, I'd be wearing a pizza restaurant. Uh, and so we've learned <laughs> healthy options and great sit-down restaurants for our citizens. Uh, as we look at the southeast corner of Baseline, Aldi has announced and a number of other sit-down restaurants at the northeast corner of Baseline and 59th Avenue, a true mixed-use option with office uh, services for our citizens and restaurants. There is uh, becoming a tremendous foodie scene in this area in Levine and then kind of east to 35th Avenue. In fact, one of the most yelped about French restaurants in the state of Arizona is now in Levine. It wasn't there five years ago and it's getting great attraction in the area. When most people look at the picture on the screen in front of you, they say, yep, that's a lot of pavement. As economic developers, we see all the job opportunities and the capital investment and new revenue uh, that exist on either side of the freeway and we are really excited about what's coming along. Again, as you see the entire picture on that western end, uh, our, our uh, southern alignment is predominantly built out with residential, and there'll be some retail amenities that come in, but along the South Mountain Technology Corridor, we see great opportunity for bringing in, in new jobs as we move forward. We'll look at this as one of our preferred places to do business and are promoting it as a true employment corridor to our existing businesses, to site selection consultants and the commercial real estate community. And we're direct marketing to companies, not just on a national level, but on a global level. And a number of you have been helping us with that marketing effort and we're starting to see some real traction. But most importantly, it's the phase now is recruiting those community-minded uh, commercial developers who are gonna build the space that companies want to be in. 90% of our prospects are looking for existing space. They're not looking for a build to suit. We're always lucky when that happens, but we've got a, you know, this is definitely an, a, a time with us when you build it and they'll come. And that's what we're working right now is building it. And ultimately out of that will come those jobs in the knowledge intensive economies and the things that this council has talked about for so long. We are uh, in our full marketing and promotion of this corridor, and with that, we'd love to take any questions you might have. Wonderful. Councilman Nowakowski. Well, first of all, Mayor, I just really want to thank um, Tom Remus that overseen the project on behalf of the City of Phoenix, and I think Tom was in our office every other day just giving us updates and letting us know what was going on, so Tom, really, I really want to thank you. Also, the leadership of Alan and, and Chris Mackey, we brought in all the stakeholders, and we asked, what would you like to see in this area? One of the things that people were saying is that there was a lot of warehouses, and that they wanted to see some quality jobs out there, that they wanted to create a tech corridor just like Chandler and Gilbert had. And we said, well, who better than Chris? So we basically got together a team, and we're starting this tech corridor to bring in some of those quality jobs, not just within the United States, but companies throughout the world. So, you know, Chris, I really want to thank you and also Alan for thinking outside of the box when it came time to um, put in those streets and sidewalks and, and bringing those developers together and coming up with um, innovative ways to make all that happen earlier than later. You know, and then basically also, you know, our mayor was really behind um, the flood, I mean, when it rains, Levine would be flooded every year. So we made sure that we had some, um, some retention areas along the freeway. So now when it rains, it, Levine's not gonna be flooded anymore. We're gonna have a freeway that actually goes, a bridge over the South River before 68th, 67th Avenue would be flooded out and there was no way out of Levine except for 51st Avenue and 35th Avenue. So I just really wanna thank you all for being innovators and, and making this all happen. Also, um, the community. 
I mean, it was just incredible how the community came together. 12 years ago, I was elected, and one of the top priorities I had, and my chief of staff back then was um, uh, Ruben Gallegos, that's a congressman now, and his number one duty was to make this happen. This has been on the books for over 30 years, and it hasn't been done, so let's organize. So basically, with his help and with the help of our office and all the stakeholders, we actually just ran sort of like a political campaign. We got the community involved. It was a grassroots campaign, and we just started lobbying um, all, the, all the elected officials from our um, federal um, delegation to our state level to our county level, to MAG, to anybody who would hear us, right? And then we finally got done. So this was really a grassroots effort in making this project happen. And basically, I, it's sort of like a miracle. I mean, it really is. You know, we have some individuals that sit on the um, our planning villages, right? You know, we have the chairman right now for the Levine uh, Village, um, Robert, that's back there. Hi, Robert, thank you for being out here. Lisa, and then we have Stephanie and all the other individuals from the Lavina Street of Mountain that were really um, the advocates to making this happen. So I really want to thank you all. And we finally got a freeway in Levine and in Strea. Thank you. Excellent. Councilwoman Stark. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Somewhere I think former Councilman Doug Glinger is looking down and smiling. I know he had a lot to do with that, but then Councilman Nowakowski came along. And I was planning director at the time, and he said, let's get going, Deborah." <laughs> and you certainly did. And you had a lot of, lot of foresight in what was going to happen, and it's really become a reality. So kudos to you. And I want to say kudos to planning department, Mark Thornton. I know you had a lot to do with it as well, and I appreciate that. But this really is a true success story, and a lot of credit goes to all those leaders down in the Levine area. So kudos to all the village committee members that represent Levine, and congratulations once again, Mr. Nowakowski. You've got a great freeway in your district. Thank you. Thanks for getting this started, and then planning department continued to work on it. Uh, Council Member Garcia. Yeah, so, uh, again, thankful I was involved in, in any of this. I think staff's done a great job. Um, I think the vision's there. I really hope that when it comes to us making zoning de decisions from billboards to whatever we need to figure out, that we take the leadership and make sure that this vision of having uh, the growth and the jobs and all these things happening, um, we can work together. And so I'm just looking forward to, to that next phase and taking part in this next phase of of making sure we get the right development, the jobs, and improve the quality of life of, of the people in that area. So thank you. Thank you, and that's, that's a great comment. We do, although we have a great success so far, we still need that vision and to really go out and make sure we make the case to high wage employers if we're gonna make this the great employment corridor. The work, the work is still very much beginning, but we, we have a lot to celebrate today. Um, we have a few members of the community who have been with this long time. Uh, I think Stephanie Hurt might be this. I, I'm a proud owner of a Build the 202 Freeway shirt, which I was told I could not wear today. Uh, but I think you might have been the source of that. Uh, and it's done. So would you be willing to come up for public comment? And Stephanie will be followed by Sid Manning. All right, I'm Stephanie Hurd at 10207 South 47th Avenue in Levine. Um, I have so much in my head and I can't believe it's open, I had to write it down because I'll be all over the place. Um, but first thought was, do you think we could get Ed Zerker and maybe Chris Mackey to milk the cow this year? Um, <laughs> all right, the South Mountain uh, Congressman Ed Pastor Freeway is beautifully decorated, has incredible views, the section that cut through the freeway was so controversial, but it looks so cool. I love it. It's awesome. Um, it, I would have preferred to see more of the mountain views. I went and got my glasses, and then I'm not wearing them. Just a minute. Um, in Ahwatukee, it's blocked. It would have been really nice to see those, but I know why they did that. Um, in my opinion, it's the best, most beautiful freeway in Phoenix. Um, Chris Mackey, as she said, her phone is ringing off the hook due to the now open South Mountain South Mountain Technology Corridor, 
Levine is about to be built out and be the cool hot spot. I can't believe it's finally open, and it's amazing how much time it saves it, us. We love it. It's, it's crazy it's a time saver, and we love to avoid baseline at 51st. So we absolutely love it. Even though no one is more excited about the freeway being open than me, I must share one final point. Thousands of us were achingly disappointed that ADOT, along with the governor's office, canceled the long-awaited, highly anticipated freeway completion community celebration. I'm actually ashamed we fought for years to support this project and they didn't make it happen. This is the single largest freeway project in Arizona history, built at one time. Nothing you can say will make it better. It's over and it's done. The ironic thing is that Ed Pastor would have been the very first one to stand up and assure the community would be there with tequila shots. Mm -hmm. That said, it has been such a fantastic benefit to our community in so many ways. Um, I would appreciate the support of council and the mayor, of course, to define the unique responsible development that's coming in the Levine area. Also, Chris, um, Mimi Forno's is the Italian restaurant that is off the charts. If you haven't been, you gotta go, it's fantastic. And um, I also want Grimaldi's pizza. Shh. Bless it. But no, we absolutely love it. Thank you. Yeah. And I think our city manager has already milked the cow, so yes. We just, we all fell to Councilman Nowakowski's great cow milking deal. Uh, Mayor and council members, my name is Sid Manning. I live at 3220 West Seton Drive in Levine. I've been a Levine resident for 20 years. I've been so looking forward to this freeway, and I love it. Absolutely love it. I was driving around saying, is it open? Because I commute to Tempe. I work for a very large employer in the Valley, and I'm super excited about some potential high-tech jobs. I'd love to not make the big commute. Um, I appreciate uh, and value uh, the name. Uh, Congressman Ed Pastor has done a ton for our community in this state, and I'm really glad that his name was chosen to uh, uh, be dedicated um, for the freeway. Um, hey, I have a fast commute. It's cut my commute in half. My stress level is way down going to and from work. I'm extremely appreciative of that. Um, I love the decorative walls. I really do. I thought the, you know, the textures and the color palette, extremely well done. It blends in with the mountain, and um, that was just perfect. It, you know, there's still a few bugs to work out, but, I mean, this has been a huge project. It was uh, un, a come under budget. Uh, it was done very, very well. A, a, couple of, a couple of points about the bugs to work out. The, uh, the on and off ramp at Estrella is a bit of a challenge. It's got that double figure eight and there are sidewalks with rolled curbing, and it's hard to tell if you're going around that w double figure eight, it'd be easy for people to go on those sidewalks, so that's something that we might consider, you know, marking or whatever. Um, crossing 51st Avenue at Estrella, Elliott, and Dobbins, that's gonna be a challenge. There's gonna need to be maybe some interim stop signs or some stop lights, so, you know, please, please consider that. Um, you know, I know uh, the communities around uh, 17th Street and probably Desert Foothills are a little bit sensitive to the noise, so hopefully that can be, that can be worked out, but super appreciative. Um, the two things that I would ask is um, definitely high-tech, progressive aerospace and other jobs for that area would be perfect. And the other thing I would ask is, um, Let's do responsible development. We have a general plan. Let's make sure that, that the Levine area looks and feels nice. There's high quality development. And I would love uh, support for a scenic uh, corridor. Billboards along that freeway should just completely be banned. The views are beautiful. South Mountain, Estrella's to the south, the Santans. And so um, just like we did with uh, State Route 51, the 101, Dobbins, Baseline, Scenic Corridor routes, would love to see that done in this area. And I would love to be a community member working with the village and others to make sure that we can see that happen. So thanks again for getting the freeway built. I love it. And Chris, you're in trouble for giving away my favorite restaurant. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you for your testimony and long time work on this project and there are a few other individuals here who have been very involved as well, so thank all of you. Do we have any final council member? Councilwoman Pastor. So I don't think this Freeva would be here without a vision and a visionary uh, named Congressman Ed Pastor. So I think it's suiting that the freeway was named after him. 
There was never uh, any discussion about it, nothing. It was nothing. It happened to be uh, Representative Diego Espinosa who approached the family uh, right after his death and came to us and said, we want to carry this because we think he needs to be honored because the freeway funding along with MAG, ADOT, all those in the transportation world would not have been possible if he hadn't been a strong advocate for transportation and infrastructure. So the freeway has been in, in the books for maybe, I want to say 20 years now, Sid, uh, 35, yeah, and, and been in, in the planning. Um, and so uh, it's suiting that it is named after him, and it's a great honor. I just want to let you know that uh, the family was taken back by it and shocked uh, when he, uh, Representative uh, Diego Espinosa and the rest of the legislator and Latino caucus uh, championed it and, and really moved it forward. Uh, we were, it was a great uh, birthday gift for me because it was during that time. My birthday was that week and I received a birthday gift and then it was a great uh, anniversary gift to my mom because the dedication was the day of their anniversary. So I really appreciate everybody uh, that uh, has helped him or helped him and uh, really championed and was with him during his journey. So really appreciate it. Thank you. I don't think we can top that as a final comment. So we are adjourned. <laughs>